first two. They're trying to make it zero. Donnie Moore, ready to go. He cranks it up again. Here's the pitch. Swung on and missed strike three. The Angels have won the American League Western Division title. And the celebration is on. Let's the get it We're so excited. The story of the 1986 California Angels. In the weeks before the 1986 season began, it looked like all the sports and baseball journals were saying the same thing. The Angels are too old. They won't contend. They'll finish sick. But the men on the field paid no attention to springtime speculation. Preseason predictions are, are exactly what they are. They're just guesses. Somebody's got, you know, is bored and has to come up with something to write about. If the people making those selections were such experts, they'd probably be inside the game rather than outside the game. What they said in the, you know, preseason means nothing. Uh, you got to go out there and play 162 games and try to do your best. For the Angels, that effort to do their best began on April 8th, opening day in Seattle, as Bobby Gritch started the season with a bang. Here's Bobby Gritch to lead things off in 1986. The first pitch of 86 is out of here. Bobby Gritch starts it in grand fashion for the Angels, and everybody's out to greet him. The Angels were starting clean as they began the year with one major change, adding a 23-year-old rookie to the starting lineup. Number 21. First baseman, Wally Joyner. Reaches out, pushes it right side, base hit, rounding third, heading home is Burleson. The ball game is tied. This young man really looks for real, doesn't he? Oh, Wally Joyner's for real, all right. Hitting for average, hitting for power. Joyner served notice in April to the baseball world that the Angels had a potent new weapon in their arsenal. Amid all the attention and excitement he created, Joyner was helped by the steadying influence of Reggie Jackson. Showing strength, Reggie and the rookie made a great one-two punch. And here's Reggie, who's hit three. He hits this one deep to right. Well hit, going, it's gone. Back-to-back -back home runs by Joyner and Jackson. And the Angels have a 2-0 lead. In 86, Reggie led by example as he adjusted his stroke and went to the opposite field when necessary to get the job done. And on April 30th, who was leading the league with a 420 batting average? None other than Reggie Jackson. Another superstar was enjoyed by Brian Downing, one of the Angels' most consistent players. With 25 RBIs in his first 23 games, Downing was up, and he would keep his production up all year long, driving in 95 runs, 13 of them game winners. Swung out, and there's a drive. Get way back left field. Manning looking. It's gone. A home run for Downing. And the Angels win it as the ball clears at the 368 mark out in left field. For manager Gene Mock and the Angels in 1986, late inning homers and come from behind rallies were all part of the puzzle. Parts that fell in piece by piece. It was a season of startling surprises, and the greatest of them all might well be called Angels Miracle Magic. On April 26th at the Metrodome in Minnesota, an example of that miracle magic was sent to the Angels in unlikely fashion. In this game, the Twins were romping, flexing their early season muscle at California's expense. With the Twins leading 6-1, the Angels were given a sign, and it came from the heavens at that. A thunderstorm with 60 mile an hour winds had ripped a hole in the roof of the Metrodome, delaying the game, and then the roof fell in on the Twins. In the ninth, George Hendrick blasted a two-run home run, and so did Rupert Jones. The Twins led 6-5, to five. then it was time to visit Wally World. Wally Joyner is the man of the hour for the Angels. There's Reggie at first base. He's the tying run. The Angels refusing to go quietly here tonight. Not quite over yet. They're on their feet, those remaining after the uh, semi-collapse of the roof. Well, the fans have seen a lot of activity here tonight. The pitch to Joyner. Hit high in the air to right field, way back, it is gone! And the upper deck of the Angels are on top. Wally Joyner 
It's a two run dinger the third home run of the inning by the Angels and the Angels lead this one now by a score of seven to six. Well how about this for a ninth inning. The seven to six Angel win was a miracle indeed and it helped California finish April with a 13 and eight record. But the month of May proved to be another matter. The Angels were held down by a case of the Blues as nagging hurts and frustration started to mount. But fortunately, the Angels soon got a springtime pick-me-up from 23-year-old Dick Schofield. Already highly valued for his glove, Schofield showed the kind of form in May that would carry him through to career highs in runs, hits, home runs, and RBIs. Going on to belt 13 home runs, Schofield became the first Angel shortstop to reach double figures in that category since 1970. You know, the more bats you get, uh, the better you're going to get, hopefully. And uh, the home run power, you know, it happens by mistake a lot of the time. You know, you, like a few years back, if someone made a mistake, I might not drive the ball. But, you know, now I'm waiting and trying to get my pitch and uh, trying to hit it. That kind of modesty also carries over to Schofield's play at short, which is now recognized throughout the major leagues as among the best. I'm not a very flashy player, and uh, I just try to try to do what I can, uh, make the outs outs, and uh, I think if you do that, uh, things will come out well. A big improvement by hard-charging Gary Pettis had California on the right track as well. In 1986, Pettis moved into first place on California's all-time stolen base list, but it was his work at the bat that really boosted the Angel effort. Unexpected as it was, Gary Pettis led the team in batting with men in scoring position, proving himself to be someone to count on in the clutch. And of course, as always, Gary Pettis was simply stellar in the field, making the kinds of gold glove plays that made him famous on television shows like This Week in Baseball. I get a thrill out of making plays and seeing myself on TV just like anyone else would have. I think without a doubt our defense has probably been the best in the league and it could very well be the best in baseball. That's certainly a widely shared sentiment and one the Angels took a great deal of pride in proving. From the infield out, the California defense consistently refused to yield its ground. Among all the thrills, a major milestone in hitting was approached on the 11th of May. Reggie trailing Mickey Mantle on the all-time home run list by one. His next will tie Mantle, and he hits it deep. And this ball is gone. A home run for Reggie Jackson, number 536. And he ties Mickey Mantle. Three days after tying the former Yankee great, Reggie marched on towards the inevitable as he faced Boston's Roger Clemens. Long drive, center field, well back, and it's gone. And Reggie Jackson moves ahead of Mickey Mantle. A short time afterwards, the event would be commemorated as Mickey Mantle himself joined the ceremony. The greatest day in my life is today because I'm getting something from a boyhood idol, a dream that I'm living today. And I think that if I could have had my way, I would have liked to have been tied with him the rest of my career. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Mick. In May, the Angels were either in first place or tied for first through the 23rd. But in Texas, Bobby Valentine's Rangers were gaining ground. And by the time the two clubs met in June, the Rangers were, in fact, on top in the West. 
a first confrontation was set for Anaheim. And though nobody knew it at the time, the stage was set for Angel's Miracle Magic. On June 16th, Texas and California opened a three-game series. For Gene Mock, the early returns were not good. Working on a no-hitter in the ninth inning was Ranger starter Charlie Huff, and his knuckleball was dancing. Got him! Inside corner. That's one, two more to go. Huff was protecting a one to nothing lead as well as his no-hitter, and he next worked to Jack Howell. Fly ball, left side, long way to go, near the line. He dropped it, fair ball. And the runner is all the way to third, but it'll probably be scored an error. It was scored an error, but Huff had to be more concerned with the next batter, Wally Joyner who just happened to be celebrating his 24th birthday. Base hit. The no-hitter is gone, and it's a tie game. Huff had lost both the no-hitter and the shutout, yet the game was still at stake. Soon, Joyner advanced to second on a pass ball. Another angel reached first on a walk, and now with two outs, Huff had a full count on George Hendrick. Here's the 3-2 again with the runners going. Got him, but it gets away. A play at first, Orlando will not throw it, and the run scores, and the Angels win on a strikeout. Nobody covered home. Truly a sudden and stunning two to one miracle victory, and two days later, in the series finale, Don Sutton realized an achievement that was far longer in the making. With the Angels up five to one against Texas, Sutton stands on the threshold of history, pursuing a goal that took more than 20 seasons to accomplish. He's one strike away from 300 victories. Gene Mock happy because his team is about to sweep the first place team in the American League West and move to within a half game of the lead. One and two the count to Gary Ward two outs in the ninth. He went around and it's over. Becoming just the 19th pitcher to win 300. Don Sutton had a dream come true. I guess when the season started, I knew if I could stay healthy, it was going to come. And it seems like that whole last inning, when I try to recapture it and recall it, I can't play it in actual speed. It's all in slow motion. And especially Gary Ward, the last pitches to him, every time I try to think it back and think it through, right up to Boone catching the ball, holding it, waving it, it, it was all slow motion. And then I guess uh, just a flood of thoughts overcame me. Only when I was able to talk about it with people who were important to me did it really sink in that, hey, this is a pretty big mountain to be standing on top of. When Sutton and the Angels descended upon Texas on June 23rd, the club was on a tear, having won five of its last six. And that trend continued as the Orange County boys danced all over the Rangers. Closing out with a one-hitter from Kirk McCaskill, California swept a three-game series with Texas for the second time in 10 days. Gene Mock's ball club had moved back into first place in the West, thanks in part to one of the best armed staves in baseball. And a big reason why was a former All-American hockey player by the name of Kirk McCaskill, who was only too glad to turn in his slap shot for a fastball, when a decision had to be made between which of the two sports he wanted to play. It was a long choice for me. I spent a year playing minor league hockey. I didn't enjoy it. And I just uh, weighed the decision which one I enjoyed better, and it came down to baseball. And that's what I wanted to pursue, so I came back. And the Angels are glad he did. McCaskill would go on to post a 17-10 and 10 record in 86, earning respect in the big leagues, especially from those who knew him best. Kurt just got quality stuff and has learned since he's been in the big leagues, has gotten better and better because he's learned himself and he's learned what it takes to win and he's learned it in a fairly short period of time. But you could see it. You can see that he has learned with each outing and gotten better and better. One factor that's helped the second year pitcher improve is a close at hand role model to look up to. I think Mike Witt is the best pitcher in the American League and I've thought that for a long time. And I kind of try to model myself after Mike and uh, I feel that if I can do you know, halfway as good as Mike is then I'll be doing okay. Okay, and then some. Through the 1986 season, Mike Witt continued to perfect his craft, and at the age of 26, the six-year veteran delivered big. Most people learn how to pitch in the minor leagues, and then you polish it up in the big leagues. But Mike has learned in the big leagues, and he's just gotten better and better. He's got a great curveball, and he's got an above-average fastball. 
and he's learning how to make pitches within the strike zone. Mike has the potential to be one of the best pitchers in this league. Mike Witt has a chance to be one of the premier pitchers in all of baseball, and I think in the last year or so, he has really matured into a leader on a pitching staff and a guy who is going to be a closer for you and will give you not just a good effort, but a great effort every time out. And he's only going to get better. Witt was on his way to a year in which he would notch an 18-10 and 10 record with a 2.84 ERA, third best in the league. But more than that, Witt gave the Angels what every team needs, consistency. His 269 innings and 14 complete games would both be among the league's top five. And there's no doubt that Angel pitching commands respect with the likes of Witt and McCaskill. We're all fortunate here with the Angels to have two like them. And most people try to figure out one man they want to build a pitching staff around. And I would take either one of those and start any pitching staff in baseball. In mid-July, the Angels were in first place, and two who helped make that happen were in Houston for the All-Star Game. Mike Witt was selected to the American League pitching staff, and he was joined by a new face, the first rookie to be voted a starting berth by the fans, a surprised Wally Joyner. Well, I think surprise is maybe an understatement. I don't think anybody, including myself, knew what was in store for me this year, and uh, it was a great honor. Uh, it, I had a great time at the All-Star Game, and it was just for uh, players to get together and to enjoy one game and it doesn't matter if you're on the bench or if you're playing just as long as you're there that's all that matters. That kind of humility combined with outstanding talent helped put Wally World on the map. In 1986 Wally Joyner made Wally World the place to be as he exploded on the baseball scene while still keeping everything in perspective. It's fitting here with Disneyland around the corner, uh, Hollywood down the street. I don't mind it. It's something that uh, if I continue to do well, uh, then, then that'll keep going and that will be maybe a sign to note if Wally Joyner is still doing well or not. Throughout the year, Joyner remained unfazed by the trials of a rookie season, playing his game well both at bat and in the field, while also winning recognition as a leading representative of Angel Baseball. I'm a Wally Joyner fan. I think it's I think it's really good because to see because he's so young, he's doing so well. You know, playing the All Stars as a rookie and all. It's just so young guys in my community can see that stuff like that can happen. Dreams do come true, and Joyner went on to a dream season with 22 homers and 100 RBIs and getting the job done. It's just a matter of when you get the spotlight, you have to realize what your responsibility is. And uh, the way I live my life and the way I. Uh, intend to live my life, it's no problem to uh, be an inspiration or be a role model for younger players. Just a youngster himself, Joyner will be an angel influence for years to come, making his name synonymous with enjoyment both to fans and himself. Uh, it's a lot of fun to be known as Wally Joyner right now. July also marked the return of John Candelaria. And yes, after recovering from a painful elbow injury, the candy man still could. Coming back from surgery, Candelaria won his first three decisions and six of his first seven as he went on to record a 10 and two mark for the season, making a strong angel pitching staff even stronger. The comeback of the Candyman coincided with the steady bombardment of angel bats. After going 15 and 11 in July, the first place angels increased their margin by rolling off 19 wins in 29 August games. During the month of August, the high-flying Angels produced an average of better than four and a half runs per game. Just as impressive, for the seventh time in eight seasons, the Angels would better the two million attendance mark. In fact, they went on to lead the league with more than two and a half million fans, and everybody had the feeling. The most wanted man throughout August was the American League Player of the Month, California's Doug DeSensei. Uh-oh, base hit, and that'll end the ball game. And Joyner will just stroll in from third base, and the Angels win it 5-4. to four. When the heat was on in August, DeSensei delivered, batting 337 for the month with nine homers and 25 RBIs, and five of those were game winners. In fact, the Sensei was a key component for the Angels throughout the entire second half. 
A veteran of more than 12 big league seasons, the Sensei's all-around play also represented a victory over pain. Pain that has become an everyday part of his major league playing life. That's another thing I've had to overcome in my career, you know, for the past eight years is dealing with a bad back. But people have said, oh, I'll be done a long time ago. But those that have said I've been done a long time ago, I'm still here. The company of angels was strongly felt all season long, but it may have been most pronounced on the evening of August 29th in a game against the Detroit Tigers. Nothing was going right for California as the Tigers were circling the bases enough times to make the angels dizzy. After eight full innings, Detroit led 12 to five and the mood in the Tiger dugout was upbeat to say the least. But in the bottom of the ninth, Tiger prowess started to disappear as the angels chipped and chipped away. Soon the score was 12 to nine and before you knew it, the angels had the bases loaded and the Tigers had Willie Hernandez on the mound as the wheels turned. The batter is Schofield who started this inning with a base hit. And I tell you, he has some power. He has 11 home runs. Now he just missed one early in this ball game. I wasn't thinking home run grand slam. I was just trying to you know, get a base hit or, you know, any type of a bloop, whatever, to get a run and keep us going. But uh, he threw the first pitch, a uh, breaking ball, strike one, and I said, uh-oh. And then he threw a screwball, which made it 0-2. I swung, it was in the dirt, and had a bad swing on it. And I kind of circled the plate, came around behind the umpire, and then I said, all right, just make contact. Base is loaded, two outs. Tigers lead by three. On the next pitch, Schofield smashes a drive deep to left, and gone. A grand slam, and the Angels win 13-12. Angel Miracle Magic had struck again. You know, 12 to 5 in the ninth inning, you're ready to go home, you know, but they won. They're never out of it. They, uh, they're believers in themselves. When in the ninth inning, when you're way behind, they come forward and do it. This was truly a season of angel miracle magic with 25 come from behind wins at home as Gene Mock and company always refused to yield. And clearly throughout the year, the ninth inning belonged to the angels. A fly ball to right. Gibson back at the fence. It's gone. A two-run homer by DeSensez. And this ball game is over. The Angels have the magic going for them this year. Fly ball hit the right field. Very deep. Moving back Henderson to the warning track. Makes a leap. It's over. Jack Howell solo home run. Wins it for California by a score of four to three. High fly ball. The deep left field. This one is gone. Ronald Daddy will take the goal. As the Angels moved into September, they were five and a half games in first place, moving relentlessly toward a divisional title. On September 26th, the scene was set, and as circumstance would have it, a victory against Texas would clinch the West, as Gene Mock knew the time had come. Tonight, tonight. For the third time in club history, the California Angels were divisional champs of the American League West, and feelings of accomplishment and pride filled the post-game clubhouse of Autry's Angels. 
This is outstanding. This is what this is what it's all about. A lot of people didn't think we were going to be even close to the top. Uh, you know, with a lot of breaks, a lot of great games come from behind. Uh, we played good enough to win this league, and we did win it. And it comes from uh, knowing how to go about your job, knowing how to win. And that could be described in one word. Great. And there were great expectations as the Angels traveled to Boston's Fenway Park for the championship series with the Red Sox. In game one, the Sox sent 24 and four Roger Clemens to the mound, but California was armed and ready. It didn't take long for the Angels to get rolling. In the second inning, California capped a rally as Brian Downing took a poke at the Green Monster and sent a pair of runs scampering home to put the Angels ahead four to nothing. That was more than enough for Mike Witt, who pitched no-hit ball through five and two-thirds innings and stayed in command the entire way for an eight to one opening victory. And following game two, the Angels would return to California with a split. In game three, Boston's flamboyant right-hander, Oil Can Boyd, was punctured by unexpected sources. Dick Schofield connected for a solo home run in the seventh, and that was soon followed by another blow from one of the series' hottest hitters, Gary Pettis. The 2-1 delivery is right on here, well to right! The Angels went on to victory and looked for the same the next night against Boston's Roger Clemens. But on this occasion, Clemens kept the Angels handcuffed through eight. But in the ninth, trailing three to nothing, Gene Mock's crew responded. Doug DeSensei led the inning off with a homer, and with one out, hope was very much alive. DeSensei's blast was followed by back-to-back -back singles, and Boston went to the bullpen for Calvin Schiraldi. Up came Gary Pettis, and his smash to left was more than Jim Rice could handle as another run dashed home. The Angels now trailed by one, and following an intentional pass and a strikeout, the magic was in the air with the base had loaded, two out, and Brian Downing at the play. The Angels trying to come up with a dramatic ninth inning rally. Hits him! It hits him with a base! Rallying for three in the ninth, the Angels sent the game into extra innings. And with a miracle feeling in the air, Jerry Naren stood on second in the bottom of the 11th with the game still tied and Bobby Gritch looking to break through against Schiraldi. Line drive bases on the left field line. Naren's the third. He's coming home. And the Angels win it. Bobby Gritch is the hero. And there's Bedlam and Anaheim. Now the Angels led the championship series 3-1 one game away from the pennant. And the next day, the sun was shining so brightly, and it looked like Bobby Gritch might once again be a hero when his incredible homer fell in to put California ahead. A magical moment, but little did anyone realize that the Angels would soon run out of miracles in 1986. No, the Angels didn't win a pennant, but they played like winners every step of the way. And the reason for that was all the support that came from the friends at home. Hello, friends. This is Gene Autry. I would just like to take this opportunity to thank all you great Angel fans for the way you have supported the 1986 team. You've been wonderful. Thank you for being a friend. Travel down a road and back again. My hat is off. Won't you stand up and take a